This is You've Already Been Hacked, recorded on 20 March 2021. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is episode 36. This week, we have a bunch of stuff to catch up on relating to solar winds, the exchange hack, and then we have some, st- some new stuff to go over. So let's get into it. The cloud and email security company Mimecast has revealed that the theft of its source code in a cyber attack linked to the solar winds breach has occurred. According to their security incident disclosure, which was published on the 16th of March, a malicious SolarWinds Orion update was used to access the company's production grid environment. In that update, the firm said that a, quote, limited number of source code repositories, unquote, were downloaded during the January attack. They added, though, that the company currently has no evidence that this code was maliciously modified or that the loss will impact any existing products. Because as we all know, once somebody has your source code, nothing bad will happen any point down the line. The company believes that the source code that was downloaded was incomplete and that it would be insufficient to build and run any aspect of their services. Along with the source code threat, some of the company's issued certificates and a limited amount of customer service connection data sets were compromised in the attack. The company was made aware of the certificate security issue by Microsoft in January, uh, which told the company a certificate used to authenticate their sync and recover continuity monitor and IEP was being exploited to target a small number of Microsoft 365 tenants from non-Mindcast IP addresses. The company issued a new certificate connection before Microsoft disabled the hijack certificate per the company's request. Mindcast recommends that customers in the United States and the UK reset any server connection credentials used on their platform as a precautionary measure. The company says that hashed credentials are also being reset and customers involved in the breach may have been notified. Mindcast has also upgraded its encryption algorithm for stored credentials and has pulled SolarWinds Orion from its infrastructure. All impacted servers have been replaced. Microsoft estimates that the attack, suspected of being the handiwork of Russian state sponsored hackers, may have required an effort of up to 1,000 engineers to create. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, has released a new tool to detect post-compromise malicious activity associated with the SolarWinds hack in an on-premises enterprise environment. The CISA Hunt and Incident Response Program, or CHIRP, is a new forensics tool and is Python-based that is designed to help SolarWinds malicious activity IOCs on Windows operating systems be detected. There's a previous tool that has already been issued, and that's called Sparrow. Now, Sparrow scans for signs of APT compromise within Microsoft 365 or Azure environments. Chirp scans for signs of APT compromise within an on-premises environment, so a little different. In the release, Chirp by default searches for IOCs associated with malicious activity detailed in two different notifications uh, that has spilled into an on-premises enterprise environment. The two different alerts refer to the SolarWinds hackers' compromise of government agencies, critical infrastructure, and private sector organizations using Trojanized SolarWinds Orion products and compromised apps, the victims. Uh, Microsoft 365 Azure environments as initial access vectors. So how does Chirp work? As Chirp performs the scan, it outputs a JSON formatted data file for further analysis in an SIEM or similar tool set. CISA advises organizations to use Chirp to analyze their environment when they want to examine Windows event logs for artifacts, 
examine Windows registries for evidence of intrusion, query Windows network artifacts, apply uh, Yara rules. Uh, also, Chirp can help them look for the presence of malware identified by security researchers such as Teardrop and Raindrop. It can also help uh, look for credential dumping certificate pools, certain persistent mechanisms identified as associated with the SolarWinds campaign, system network and Microsoft 365 enumeration, and known observable indicators of lateral movement. Now, Sparrow and Chirp are not the only tools that have been created to help with the SolarWinds compromise. CrowdStrike released a similar detection tool named the CrowdStrike Reporting Tool for Azure. Uh, FireEye issued a tool called the Azure AD Investigator. Microsoft uh, has shared uh, how to look for stolen credentials and access tokens. And there is a myriad, just a, a deluge of remediation information that exists from all of these companies and a bunch of others. And as we all know, this is likely not to go away anytime soon. Okay, so that's SolarWinds. Now let's go on to it, the exchange hack. Microsoft is investigating whether information about the exchange server vulnerabilities that was leaked prior to the patches released has had proof of concept code created that would further more exploitation. Microsoft has shared information about the vulnerabilities with security partners through the Microsoft Active Protections Program, or, M or MAPP. Some MAP partners received information about the vulnerabilities, which included a proof of concept exploit code. Microsoft reportedly investigated a potential partner leak that could have exacerbated the current wave of attacks against Exchange servers. What Microsoft is investigating is whether or not potentially sensitive information or proprietary information required to conduct the attacks was obtained through, quote, private disclosures it made with some of its security partners, unquote. Now, we don't know what that means. They, there could, they could be looking to see if partners told somebody willingly information, shared that proprietary information. Could it have been an insider threat? Could it have been... Uh, could solar winds have led to the exchange hack? I mean, there's lots of ways that that potential sensitive information could have gotten into the wrong hands. That proof of concept code that Microsoft was working on has been released into the wild, and now more APTs are attempting to capitalize on it, as well as our friends in the ransomware department. They are also uh, adding some flavor to this situation. So let's talk about that ransomware. In a new phase of attacks against on-premises exchange servers, systems that were already compromised, they are now being targeted by other groups. Organizations using exchange now have a new security headache, a never-before-seen ransomware that's being installed on servers that was already infected by state-sponsored hackers from China. Microsoft has reported the new family of ransomware deployed late this past Thursday saying that it was being deployed after the initial compromise of exchange servers. The name of the new family is ransom colon win32 slash dojocrypt.a, or commonly referred to as Deer Cry. According to the security firm Cryptos Logic, they have detected over 6,900 exposed web shells from the exchange server compromise. These are all publicly exposed and replaced there by actors exploiting the exchange vulnerability. These shells are being used to deploy the ransomware we're talking about. Anyone, literally anyone, you, if you knew the URL to one of these public web shells could gain access and complete control over these compromised servers. Now, the good news is that the current 
activity is all human operated, meaning that there has to be some level of a human on keyboard to manually install the ransomware one exchange server at a time. And these 6,900 plus exchange servers have not all been hit with Deer Cry, at least not yet. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's just move on. Let's, let's forget about that for a minute. Let's move on to some stats. The FBI has released its Internet Crime Report for 2020. The Internet Crime Compliance Center, or IC3, received last year 791,790 complaints. That's up 69% from 2019 of suspected internet crime causing more than four billion in losses. Most of the complaints were from phishing or non-payment, non-delivery scams and extortion, and about half of the losses, so that would be roughly two billion, are accounted by business email compromise, romance and confidence scams, and investment fraud. In a twisted silver lining, not silver lining sort of way, BEC compromises recorded 19,369 complaints in 2020, which is about 20% less than last year, or I mean, than 2019. That's good. However, this type of cybercrime alone caused 1.8 billion in losses, which is up. $1.7 billion since 2019. Yeah. It's up almost uh, all of it, which is frightening. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about these type of victim losses, right? Um, <clears throat> the, the top five for 2020 were these business email compromises, confidence and fraud or, or romance scans, which is a distant second, right? So if BEC was 1.8 billion, these confidence scams were only $600 million. Only. You have your investment scams, your non-payment, and then you get down to number five, which was identity theft at a mere $219 million. You want to round out that to the top 10, you got your spoofing, your real estate, your personal data breaches, uh, tech support, and finally, credit card fraud at a meager $129 million. So what, what was at the very, very, very bottom of the list? Just, just to see, um, hacktivism, 50 bucks. I guess that's not really a thing anymore. Uh, if you want something that was meaningful, the next one up from that was denial of service at 512,000. Another trend that was noticed by IC3 for 2020 was the use of identity theft. and then. Converting funds to cryptocurrency. In these cases, the initial victim, choose your, your way de jour, provided their ID to the fraudster. And then the, uh, the hackers or the fraudsters would use the ID to open up bank accounts uh, that they had received and then would can quickly transfer the money from those accounts into cryptocurrency to help basically launder and lose track of that money. Looking a little bit further, if you want some historical context, since 2016, we have seen a year-over-year -year increase in uh, losses. So how much? Well, we started in 2016 with $1.5 in losses, and all the way through 2020, you got $4.2 just in 2020 alone. You take all the years in between, and we're talking a total of 13.3 billion dollars in total losses due to internet related crime. Are we depressed enough yet? Okay, well let me do some uplifting. We got a couple of good stories to end the week with. A 22-year-old man from Cyprus was sentenced to a year in prison after pleading guilty to computer fraud, conspiracy, and computer fraud for hacking websites and extorting them for money, according to the Department of Justice this past Thursday. 
The man exploited security vulnerabilities to steal sensitive personal information from users and customer databases between October 2014 and November 2016 when he was a teen living with his mother. He used the stolen information to log into email accounts and send messages to victim websites demanding a ransom and threatening to leak sensitive data. He also obtained information on targets from a co-conspirator who had previously hacked those websites. In coordination with the Office for Combating Cybercrime of the Cyprus Police, the man is the first national to ever be extradited from Cyprus to the United States and has been sentenced to prison. He will serve one year and one day in prison. In addition to credit, he has already received for serving three years and ten months before sentencing. The individual has already paid 600000 in restitutions to victims and forfeiture of $389,000 and €70,000 to uh, various governments. And finally, a Florida teen accused of orchestrating last summer's Twitter hack the one that used celebrity accounts to make more than 100,000 in cryptocurrency scams, pleaded guilty this past Tuesday in exchange for a three-year sentence. Authorities have said that Graham Clark, now 18, and two other men used social engineering and other techniques to gain access to internal Twitter systems. They then alleged allegedly used their control to take over what Twitter has said were 130 accounts. A small sampling of the account holders included then-former Vice President Joe Biden, Tesla's founder Elon Musk, and pop star Kanye West, and philanthropist and Microsoft former uh, founder and former CEO Bill Gates. Prosecutors have alleged the then-high-profile accounts, many with millions of followers, were used to promote scams that promised to double their returns if people deposited Bitcoin into the attacker's controlled wallets. The scheme generated more than $117,000 U.S. dollars. The hackers also took over accounts with short usernames, which are highly coveted in a criminal hacking forum circle called calling itself OG Users. Clark agreed to plead guilty in return for a three-year prison sentence and three years of probation following. The agreement allows Clark to be sentenced as a youthful offender, a status that allows him to avoid a minimum 10-year sentence he would have received if he was convicted as an adult. Clark will serve his time in a state prison designed for young adults, and he may be eligible to serve some of his sentence in a military-style boot camp. He will also receive the mandatory minimum if he violates terms of his probation. The plea agreement bars Clark from using computers without permission and supervision from law enforcement. He will also have to submit to searches of his property and give up the passwords to any accounts he controls. That's all for the news this week. I'm your professor of cyber risk. And we'll talk again soon. If you like this podcast, share it with your colleagues and friends. Your support is how we are able to continue to make this content. Thank you.